At least since the Enlightenment period, the Western world has been driven by a dialectic between reason and revelation, or what the great 20th century political thinker Leo Strauss referred to as Athens and Jerusalem. In recent years, though, this dialectic has become increasingly imbalanced, resulting in deleterious social and political changes. Thus, to correct it, it first becomes necessary to analyze the underlying structure of this dialectic, to identify the source of the imbalance. One obvious difference between the two is in regards to epistemology, namely the difference between faith and reason. However, perhaps a more pertinent distinction is that these two represent very different outlooks on the world, differing in their ontological perspectives on what the world actually is. After the Enlightenment, Athens came to be increasingly associated with the scientific picture of the world, together with his assumed metaphysical framework of scientific materialism. In this view, which is essentially an extension of democracy and atomism, what we see is all there is. There is no use for a god on such a view, and likewise the concepts of a soul or an afterlife make little sense on such a view either. If we are comprised of atoms, then back into atoms we are dissolved. By contrast, the view held by Jerusalem has traditionally tended towards a dualist metaphysics. In addition to a natural world of material objects and their effects, it holds a supernatural world of immaterial entities. In this world, a god exists that judges human actions, and man is thought to go on after death, as an immaterial soul separate from a physical body. In turn, these two outlooks inform human actions differently, which then feeds down into social and ultimately political consequences. Without a god over us, morality tends to be seen as more a matter of convention, and thus ultimately as a political construct. Of course, the suggestion may arise that an objective set of principles could ground moral action instead, something like perhaps Kant's categorical imperative. However, within a materialist metaphysic, such concepts feel like abstractions, with no independent weight. The material universe would simply continue on indifferently, whether or not we behave according to them. Furthermore, one could violate such principles on such a worldview, and as long as one is clever or powerful enough, one could escape any consequences for one's actions. In such a universe, as long as one outwits justice all the way to the grave, one could, in effect, beat the system. By contrast, the edifice of Jerusalem acts to provide a staying power for such norms. Jerusalem's proposition of an afterlife, as well as a god, introduces the concept of cosmic justice, which acts as a check on the baser inclinations of human nature. This, of course, filters down into political ramifications. As the political philosopher Thomas Hobbes pointed out in The Leviathan, fear of damnation is helpful at maintaining the political order of the commonwealth. Thus, the concept of cosmic justice and its absence produce two very different sets of social and political consequences. This is very markedly seen in the modern day in the statistics of political affiliation by party. In a Pew study of religious landscape by party affiliation, 73% of the right-leaning Republican Party claimed belief in God while only 55% of the left-leaning Democratic Party claim belief in God. Just as noticeably, when cosmic justice concepts such as hell were surveyed, there was again a marked 18% difference between Republicans and Democrats. 69% of Republicans were found to believe in hell, contrasted with only 51% of Democrats. This elegantly illustrates a very real confirmation of Thomas Hobbes' observation about the social utility of mass belief in damnation. One's political leanings are directly affected by one's beliefs about God, cosmic justice, and the afterlife. However, there is just one problem with this. So long as the dualist framework seen as undergirding such concepts is caught in its current dialectic with materialism, it is doomed to failure. A 2020 Phil Papers survey showed that a total of nearly 51% of philosophers held to one of three physicalist models of the mind. Adherence to dualist views, by contrast, was less than half that, at just under 22%. Belief in God among professional philosophers, meanwhile, was smaller still, at less than 15%, contrasted by almost 73% who were atheists. Among eminent scientists, polls show that the numbers are not much better for belief in God or an afterlife. In a 2013 poll of Royal Society scientists, nearly 60% of physical scientists and over 90% of biological scientists said that they strongly disagreed that God exists. Meanwhile, over 70% of physical scientists, and well over 90% of biological scientists, 
strongly disagreed with the existence of an afterlife. Simply put, our modern Western intelligentsia is telling us that the framework of Jerusalem is wrong, and where our intelligentsia leads, our society inevitably follows. A 2017 Big Think article pointed out that religion is in decline in the US, with a marked rise in the nuns, people who hold to no religious affiliation. Moreover, data predicts this trend will only accelerate. As the article notes, for example, Protestantism dropped below 50% for the first time in 2012, and is predicted to fall below 40% within 20 years. The reason it is doomed has to do with the structure of explanation itself. Explanation works by rational means, with conclusions and the terms in them, neatly and logically following from premises and the terms in them. Dualism, however, entails a mismatch of terms in many of the things it is required to account for, perhaps explaining why it is widely rejected by academia. A good case of this can be seen in cosmological arguments for God, wherein God is posited as the first cause of the universe. This was highlighted in a 2014 debate between prominent Christian apologist William Lane Craig and the famous cosmologist Sean Carroll. Despite Dr. Craig using the Kalam cosmological argument, often thought to be among the strongest versions of the cosmological argument, the debate has been widely agreed to have been won by Dr. Carroll. A post-mortem study of the debate illustrates exactly this problem. To show how, watch Carroll's remarks at what is thought to be the pivotal point in the debate. I want to challenge the first of the premises, that if the universe began to exist, it has a transcendent cause. The problem with this premise is that it is false. There's almost no explanation or justification given for this premise in Dr. Craig's presentation. But there's a bigger problem with it, which is that it is not even false. The real problem is that these are not the right vocabulary words to be using when we discuss fundamental physics and cosmology. This kind of Aristotelian analysis of causation was cutting-edge stuff 2,500 years ago. Today we know better. Our metaphysics must follow our physics. That's what the word metaphysics means. In modern physics, you open a quantum field theory textbook or a general relativity textbook, you will not find the words transcendent cause anywhere. What you find are differential equations. This reflects the fact that the way that physics is known to work these days is in terms of patterns, unbreakable rules, laws of nature. Given the world at one point in time, we will tell you what happens next. There's no need for any extra metaphysical baggage like transcendent causes on top of that. It's precisely the wrong way to think about how the fundamental reality works. What Carroll is pointing out is that the initial state of the universe simply cannot be derived from God, at least as Craig defines the concept. When one speaks of the universe, what one is really speaking of is a zero-point field, described by quantum mechanics, sitting in a de Sitter space, described by general relativity. Causation, however, requires explanation, and explanation in physics is mathematical. What Carroll is pointing out is that given that God is not traditionally described in mathematical terms, God is not even what a possible explanation for the initial state of the universe could look like. Carroll's view, meanwhile, is par for the course within the discipline of cosmology, the field of science best equipped to inform us about the origins and potential causes of the universe. In a paper titled, Why Almost All Cosmologists Are Atheists, Carroll writes, If we accept the scientific method as a way to determine the workings of reality, are we led to a materialist or theist conclusion? Naively, the deck seems to be stacked against theism. If we are looking for simplicity of description, a view which only invokes formal structures and patterns would appear to be simpler than one in which God appeared in addition. Simply put, within cosmology, there is no reason to posit explanations that do not derive the formal structure of the universe. When explanations that do derive the formal structure of the universe work just fine, and moreover, logically follow in their explanations. And this sort of reasoning works not only for the Kalam, but for the entire class of cosmological arguments, long seen to be at the very top of the best arguments for God's existence. If this is the best that can be mustered for God's existence, and it is so handily defeated in debate, then it is not likely that the other arguments can fare any better. And indeed, this appears to unfortunately be the case. The fine-tuning argument, for example, long seen as the runner-up, easily has physicalist alternatives in the form of any number of multiverse proposals, each having been posited for independent reasons. 
The teleological argument has been critiqued for having a similar problem. In fact, its modern form, commonly known as intelligent design, is often rejected by critics as unscientific, precisely because it is trying to posit non-physical explanations for physical phenomena in biology. Once again, the terms in the explanants do not match the terms in the explanandum. Below that, the situation goes from bad to worse. Other arguments, such as the ontological argument, appear to pull rabbits from hats, while arguments such as the moral argument suffer from obvious circularity. While these arguments may be convincing to those within religious circles, for subconscious and sociological reasons, none of these arguments will be very convincing to those on the outside of religious circles, much less within relevant scientific circles such as cosmology. For these arguments to have staying power in the modern world, belief in God has to be of the same type of belief and certainty as belief in the photoelectric effect or the superposition principle, or it simply will not be strong enough to convince those on the outside. Meanwhile, the religious circles in which belief in these arguments is held together by social forces will continue to slowly evaporate from the outside, as is already happening. Simply put, these arguments are not convincing enough to reverse this trend. However, these arguments are needed to be convincing if these deleterious trends within Western societies are to be reversed. And thus it appears that one pole of Western civilization, that of Jerusalem, has a critical weakness which, left unaddressed, threatens the social fabric of Western civilization itself. Unfortunately, this weakness appears to have been exploited by powerful societal movers and shakers, which ultimately gave rise to the new atheism movement of the 2000s and early 2010s. The effect of social engineering that this has produced has become increasingly apparent in recent years. Nature abhors a vacuum, and as religion in the West has begun to cave in, it has been replaced by what Elon Musk refers to as the woke mind virus. As religion has receded from public life, so too have traditional views of gender and sexual mores which undergird the family unit, as well as support for the nation-state. A recent Wall Street Journal survey found that only 38% of Americans now say that patriotism is very important to them, a number that is down from 70% in 1998. These values have been quickly replaced by radical and increasingly extremist forms of leftism, alienating those in the normal part of the political spectrum and accelerating societal decay. Well, you and I are both like in that little group of people, maybe it's a bigger group now, yeah. who, who are called conservatives, who haven't really changed. Right. I don't see or think of you as a conservative. I'm definitely, yeah, like, I, I, I at least think of myself as a moderate, uh, you know, uh, so, I mean, uh, at least, the, like, <laughs> I've spent a, a massive amount of my life energy building sustainable energy, uh, you know, electric yes. vehicles and, and batteries and solar and stuff uh, to help save the environment. That's, that's, not, that's not a, you know, no, no, no. It's, it, it's not exactly far right. No, you, you, know? drew that diag <laughs> you drew that diagram once where you're yeah. here. I, I related to that and like the world has changed. Right. I feel the same way. I feel like very often wokeness is, is not building on liberalism. It's the opposite of liberalism. I can mention yes, exactly. many this examples is... where it's the op including free speech. These trends are beneficial to the same corrupt global and moneyed interests fueling this drive. If one collapses religion, the social order that maintains the family unit and popular support for the nation state quickly follows suit, and one is then free to feed on the resulting decay. He brought, we were, is at the house one night and uh... We were talking, he was talking and he started laughing. He said, Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was about? And uh, I said, I, I'm pretty conventional thinking about it at that point. And I said, I think it's about women having the right to work, getting equal pay with men, just like they won the right to vote, you know? And he started to laugh. He said, you're an idiot. And I said, why am I an idiot? He said, you want me, let me tell you what that was about. We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded women's lib, you know? And we're the ones who got all over the newspapers and television, the Rockefeller Foundation. He says, and you want to know why? He says, there were two primary reasons. And they were, one reason was, we couldn't tax half the population before women's live. And the second reason was, now we get the kids in school at an early age. We can indoctrinate the kids how to think. So it breaks up their family. The, the kids start looking at the state as the family, as the school, as the officials as their family, not as the parents teaching them. And so those are the two prim the primary reasons for women's love, which, which I thought up to that point was a noble thing. 
you know, when I saw their intentions behind it, where they were coming from, when they created it, and the thought of it, I saw, I saw the evil behind what I thought was a noble adventure. However, it is not beneficial to the rest of society, nor Western civilization at large. Which then raises the question, how do we reverse this trend? Is this possible, or are we doomed to decay into a civilization of Nietzsche's last men? To answer this, it is necessary to see what is wrong with the materialist dualist dialectic in the first place. As it turns out, the entire dialectic upon which this dystopian state of affairs is based is itself false. Neither dualism nor materialism can possibly be true. Materialism rests on the Democritian assumption of atoms of matter floating in a void of space. However, science in recent years has explicitly falsified the very existence of such matter. Experimental quantum mechanics has repeatedly falsified the reality of matter. First with the quantum non-realism result in the 2007 test of the Leggett inequality, followed shortly thereafter by similar experiments in the Cochin-Specker theorem and quantum erasers. Likewise, material explanation cannot account for consciousness. The famed hard problem of consciousness renders this impossible. Material third-person terms of explanation cannot derive irreducibly first-person mental terms, placing such concepts as the emergence of consciousness in the same category as magic and pixie dust. So Laplace talked about the demon, the demon who knew all about the position of every last atom throughout the universe. In these cases of weak emergence, like the emergence of life from biology, if the demon knew all about the position of every last particle and did incredibly complex computations with his computer mind, he could figure out everything there is to know about life, about metabolism, about the processes that emerge. The difference with strong emergence is you could give Laplace's demon every, all that information about every last atom, every last molecule. Laplace's de demon still on that basis could not tell you, could not figure out all the facts about consciousness. Indeed, there would be no reason for him to predict that consciousness should emerge at all. Simply put, materialism is wrong, but so too is dualism. For the same reason that matter cannot explain the emergence of mind, dualism cannot account for the mind's interaction with matter. Interaction is defined by shared properties between matter and mind, something that dualist metaphysics strictly disallows. Similarly, it cannot explain the origin of the universe for precisely the reasons previously discussed by Carroll. However, what if there was a way to disrupt and reverse this trend almost instantaneously? My suggestion is a radical social experiment to place a single, simple idea into the minds of every man, woman, and child in Western civilization. The idea that their world isn't real. Of course, the problem is that under ordinary circumstances, such an idea would be seen as ridiculous. If a long-haired hippie were to propose such a concept, we might ask the question, what are you smoking? Followed shortly thereafter by, can I have some? The question then becomes, how do we make the concept stick? The answer is simple, with science. It is one thing when the man on the street says that the world isn't real. It is an entirely different thing, however, when the top physicists in the world are saying exactly the same thing. The future, at least of this development, will be that we start actually with information. So information is going to be our starting point. Uh, and space-time is not something that we start with. I seem real enough, don't I? Well, yes. But surprising new clues are emerging that everything, you and I and even space itself, may actually be a kind of hologram. There's another theorem, which is called Koch and Specker theorem. It's much less known. Uh, and that theorem tells us that the culprit is actually our notion of reality. To put it precisely, we know that it is wrong to assume that the features of a system which we observe in the measurement exist prior to the measurement. So recent experiments led by a group at the University of Vienna, Austria, provide the most compelling evidence yet that there is no objective reality beyond what we observe. And Einstein's intuition told him, like everybody's intuition tells them, that things are really there when you're not looking at them. Well, he was wrong, right? <laughs> you know, th that intuition is incorrect. So the proposition is that the distance between them is somehow an illusion, it's somehow a kind of a mirage, or maybe a better way of putting it, it's a construction. Is the three-dimensional world an illusion? In the same sense that a hologram is an illusion, perhaps. 
I think, I'm inclined to think, yes, that the three-dimensional world is a kind of illusion and uh, that the ultimate precise reality is the two-dimensional reality at the surface of the universe. With the authority of hard science behind this, the average person will readily accept such a concept, despite its strongly counterintuitive nature. Fortunately, just such a consensus exists within quantum gravity, which informs us that the fabric of space is an illusory construct. Similarly, results from quantum mechanics show the same of matter. This contrast between what the physics is telling us and our naive realist intuitions is so strong that some philosophers have even begun to push back on it, arguing that we should adopt scientific anti-realism about the basic facts of quantum mechanics, rather than literally believing what the science is saying. If the only way to save our materialist intuitions is to adopt a postmodern rejection of science, then the case is already closed and this could be capitalized upon to catalyze a mass shift in public perception about the nature of reality and their place in it. These concepts already exist and can be easily packaged and popularized for immediate mass consumption. Additionally, in the age of online gaming, mass audiences can readily recognize and intuitively grasp the parallels between the apparent weirdnesses in modern physics and the information processing effects ubiquitous to computer games such as have been explored and popularized by individuals like Brian Whitworth. If presented the right way, the average man or woman is then forced into a rather peculiar dilemma. Either accept what the physicists are saying about the illusory nature of space-time, or be seen as rejecting science in favor of intuition, placing one into the same camp as Flat Earthers. The strength of such an effect on the mass audience is then increased markedly with the number of popularizers presenting such ideas. As such, it is necessary to saturate the public consciousness with such ideas. Once this has taken hold, it then becomes important to force a second but vastly more intuitive idea into the public mind. The prior fact needs to be continuously contrasted with a constant and simultaneous public awareness campaign regarding the facts of philosophy of mind, appealing to the basic a priori facts about consciousness intuitively known by the man on the street, and the ridiculous nature of materialist attempts to deny these facts. If space-time is recognized as an illusion, but it is continuously pointed out that consciousness can't possibly be, then the final conclusion can be handily accepted as mainstream fact. Consciousness must necessarily be more fundamental than the illusion. Once these concepts take hold, the entire false dialectic, as well as its destructive consequences, is undermined and ripped up by the roots, by forcing a radical and rapid paradigm shift in mass consciousness. What replaces the materialist-dualist dialectic, then, is a science-based understanding of idealism, which has immediate consequences for the dialectic between Athens and Jerusalem. If the world is viewed as a simulation within God's mind, rather than as an external independent reality with which an immaterial God can only interact via some inexplicable magic, suddenly religion and science are no longer seen as being in conflict. The concept of God comes back instantly as the base consciousness grounding the rest of reality. Meanwhile, socially important concepts such as the afterlife and cosmic justice are immediately brought back as well. The mind cannot cease when the brain ceases, if the brain is realized to be only part of a virtual avatar for consciousness. Mind-brain correlations can still be explained, but without materialist preconceptions attached to them, lack of an afterlife ceases to be the default view. It should be noted that in prior popular presentations of these concepts, the average response from the average individual is more often than not to be mind-blown rather than incredulous, allowing them to be easily receptive to its implications. If this were to be repeated on a mass scale, it could easily cause a very rapid perspective change within society, with religion becoming acceptable once again to the modern mind. This would then filter down into the consequent social and political modifications, mending church-state divisions and creating social pressures needed to modify the currently toxic woke political environment so as to detoxify it. The only remaining question, then, is how to socially engineer such a modification to the political environment on a mass scale. When engineering such modifications to the social environment, it is necessary to understand the forces that drive them. Specifically, perhaps, the two most important social drivers concerning belief are the Milgram effect and the Ash effect, the former referring to authority bias and the latter to peer pressure. The Milgram effect owes its name to Stanley Milgram, a Yale researcher who showed that authority is likely to produce obedience among the average person. This effect carries over to belief. Take, for example, news stations. 
at least until recently, a claim made by a prominent anchor during a news broadcast would be more readily believed only on the news station's assumed authority. Then will that same claim made by Joe Rogan or Alex Jones. This effect is already extremely effective, as is seen in how it has been used and perhaps abused in mass media. Of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think, and this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. Solomon Ash, meanwhile, demonstrated in the 1950s that most people are willing to adjust their beliefs to fit with those of their peers. This even held true in experiments where a person's peers were instructed to report obviously wrong beliefs. But an experiment is not a public opinion poll. It examines behavior under the pressure of social forces, as the experiment of Solomon Ash reveals. The experiment you'll be taking part in today involves the perception of lengths of lines. As you can see here, I have a number of cards, and on each card there are several lines. Your task is a very simple one. You're to look at the line on the left and determine which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. All right, we'll proceed in this order. You'll give your answer. Only one of the people in the group is a real subject, the fifth person with the white t-shirt. The others are confederates of the experimenter and have been told to give wrong answers on some of the trials. The experiment begins uneventfully as subjects give their judgments. Two, 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 two. two. Three. 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 But on the third trial, something happens. Two. 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 Uh, two. The subject denies the evidence of his own eyes and yields to group influence. One. Ash found subjects went along with the group on 37% of the critical trials. But he found through interviews that they went along with the group for different reasons. One. One. They must be right. There are four of them and one of me. Uh, one. This subject's yielding is based on a distortion of his judgment. He genuinely believes that the group is correct. The question then becomes how to harness these powerful social forces to catalyze the sorts of changes we would like to see. To utilize these social dynamics, a handful of financiers would have to orchestrate an array of social media influencers in a concerted public awareness campaign to simultaneously pump out the same message. Ideally, several separate groups of influencers should be utilized towards this end. Specifically, influencers from four categories are especially important. First, science popularizers and scientists without any particular religious or political affiliation would be needed to promote the relevant physics. This could include characters such as Michio Kaku or Donald Hoffman, Secondly, are idealist or idealist sympathetic philosophers such as Bernardo Castrop or David Chalmers. Capitalizing on the information of the previous two, the third category would include religious apologists and philosophers of religion of an idealist bent. Such names as Michael Jones of Inspiring Philosophy or Josh Rasmussen come to mind. The fourth category of influencers would be those who deal in both politics and religion and the overlap of the two. Such figures could include names like Ben Shapiro, Matt Walsh or Dennis Prager. Individuals in each of these categories will have selective authority bias, being able to appeal to some groups but not others. However, if the material is being pushed out in unison for members of each group, the effect would be to reinforce and amplify the authority bias each is able to generate towards their respective audiences. This would produce an amplified social effect, ultimately resulting in a compaction cycle. Namely, the social effect would stimulate other influencers to jump on the bandwagon and increase the coherence and influence of the message. This would in turn filter down into an ash effect among the audiences of these influencers, further cementing the social force behind the idea through peer pressure. With each such cycle, these ideas would increase in intensity until they reach social dominance by destroying the cohesion of materialist conceptions of the world and their associated social and political paradigms through the process of creative destruction. Such compaction cycles in promoting physics-based idealism on social media has already proven very effective at a grassroots level, with the concept now relatively commonplace online, starting from little to no publicity 10 years ago. On a larger scale, this effect could become much more pronounced. The resulting process will likely produce some collateral damage on corporations and political movements, 
and parties that are reliant on or express such ideologies. Though as the adage goes, if you want to make an omelette, you have to break some eggs. However, given that I have no financial interest in such corporations, and am not ideologically vested in any of the political entities that would be on the receiving end of this creative destruction process, this is a sacrifice I am perfectly willing to make. At the moment, this is only a blueprint for social engineering. However, it would require some degree of coordination by other parties to implement. The purpose of this video, though, is to put the idea out there, in hopes that someone with the means of implementing it might pick it up. If implemented, though, I believe such an endeavor would be well worth the effort, and could become a rapid means of mass and drastic social change, a task I leave to any with the means to implement it. If you like this video, subscribe and support me on Patreon. And don't forget to check out the books in my Alaris novel series, Alaris, The Lances of Light, and Alaris, The Pearl of Heaven, on Amazon Kindle in the description below. You can find us on Facebook as well, at Idealism and Science vs. Atheism.